We started a, a brand new series last weekend. It's only three weeks long, so this is the second week in the series, and uh, this leads us right up to our 30th anniversary. You heard, heard that over and over again. We're uh, hoping you'll be all out to celebrate that with us. But the series, we call it Heart for the House. We've been doing this for years now, um, and this series, we decided, you know what, let's make it practical. Our vision is go, grow, give. How can we make it practical for folks to walk out of church on a weekend and know, for instance, last week we talked about um, we go to reach people far from God. Well, how, how do we do that? How do we reach people far from God? And how do you do that? How do you practically say, I'm going to reach someone at my job, at my school, wherever it might be. How am I going to literally reach people that are far from God? And so if you were not here, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. We said there are really just three things that you need to do, and one of them is you have to, to set out in prayer. In other words, the first thing you need to do is ask God in prayer, who am I supposed to talk to? Because I want you to know you're not on this planet just for yourself. God has you here now as an ambassador for him, and we're actually supposed to be talking to people. Amen? And so if you were not here, listen to that. Of course, we have to step out in faith. Love the last song that we did because there are times, man, when you're going to talk to someone that it really is a step of faith to just say, you know what, I'm going I'm to step out and talk to who I need to talk to. And then the third thing we talked about last week was we need to stand out in love. And uh, I don't know about you, but we live, in a, we live in a world right now, in a culture right now, that love, love is the way. Guys, listen, you understand what's going on in our country right now with the political divide that we have that the church should be different. Come on, I'm glad we have two people clapping. Come on. Um, when we come into church, this should be a whole different deal. And it shouldn't really be different with us when we're out there and we act like that and then we come back in here and we're all good. This, we learn in church that love trumps everything else. And, and if, if, I could, uh, if I could put this in a nutshell from last week, um, one of the things that I think I was trying to really get across to you is this. What if we, as a church, did not focus on people's problems and focus on fixing them, right? But what if, we, what if instead we focused on something different, and that was to love them? Are you all with me? Like a lot of times I think we, we, get, we think, I'm going to get my friend in church, and uh, we're going to fix him. And the truth of the matter is, I can't fix anyone, that's for sure. And you can't fix anyone if you've been married for any length of time or in a friendship for any length of time. You know, I can't fix them. That's not your job, right? My wife's job is not to fix me. My job is not to fix her. It's God's job to do that. And I believe when we come here into this place that God can do that when we open our hearts up and hear what he has to say. God can do some stuff on the inside of us. Amen? So, our first part of our vision is we go to reach people far from God. The second part of our vision is we grow in our relationship with God. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment. And our third part is we give of our lives to glorify God. So I want to just take some time today and say this. How can you and I, what can you and I do uh, to grow in our relationship with God? Now you might be here and say, no, you know, I'm doing good. I'm growing. That's awesome. But I believe there are some things you can do to grow in your relationship with God. Back in the day, back, you know, when we first started the church and, uh, you know, now, now looking back all the way back then when we started and thinking about the way that people thought then versus how they think now. I don't know if you know this or not, but when we started our church, we had um, worship experience on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night all the time. And some of you that are part of Faith Family for years, you came to every one of them. You were there every time the door opened. I mean, I, would, I, I was amazed that people would come that many times, right? But society's changed. This is what they say now that happens in our country now. Uh, people come to church 1.7 times a month, and they have two or three churches they consider their home church. That's a really different thought. Um, when I heard that, I was like, what? This is the average across America. It's not just one church. And it's not, we're just going to go to church one point. So you, they might pick your church, you know, that one time or one and a half plus times in a month. So the mentality's changed from when we pastored, because when we pastored back then, it was a totally different mentality to when we pastor here now and what people are thinking. Here's my deal. I don't think that's good. And I think we can change it. Like, I, I think you should be in church 
more than 1.7 times a month. And if it, listen, I want to talk to those that are watching us right now. Now, if you're in a prison campus, you can't change that. But uh, if you're in a house right now and you live in this area, you can change it. God literally wants you to be here. He doesn't want you to just watch online. We never, we never created online watching so we can skip church, not be around people, and just have our own little deal by ourselves, right? So I believe that's an important thing, and I believe we can change that. And I thank all of you that do come out every, every weekend. Thanks for doing that. I think it's a vital part of our Christian faith. But here's what we want to talk about today. I, I think there are things you can do to grow in your faith. And back in the day, the reason why I was talking about that, I think we thought the only thing I have to do is come to church three times a week. If I go Sunday, you know, Sunday night, Sunday morning, and I go Wednesday night, I'm good, man. I'm growing in my faith. Can I tell you that's only part of how you're going to grow in your faith? And it is not the only way to grow in your faith. And I believe if we think it's just one thing, I'm just going to come to church once a week, and that's going to cause me to grow in my faith. I don't believe it will cause you to grow in your faith just coming one time a week. I think, I think our church is great. I think when you come, you're going to hear something from the Bible that I believe is going to help change your life. But I don't believe you can do that. Think about it this way. How do you think you'll do if you ate one meal a week? Come on, help me out. Would that go well? I mean, you definitely would lose some weight, but it probably wouldn't be a healthy way, and it probably wouldn't be healthy for your life that if you ate one meal. So that is what a lot of people are doing. It's just, I'm going to do this one time a week. There's got to be more that happens than that. So I'm going to talk to you about that. So if you're taking notes, here, here's what I believe. I believe that you can do something intentionally to grow in your life and in your walk with God. And so we want, we want to talk about that. I think it's going to be a helpful uh, time. And I, I remember this about two years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. Brian Houston, who pastors Hillsong Church in Australia, he made this statement. He said, it's my spirit, my responsibility. And simply what that means is this. No one else can take responsibility for your faith. No one else can take responsibility for your Christian walk that you have. You're the only one that can do that. Now, many of you are taking responsibility today. You're here in church, and, and, and let me tell you that that's awesome. But there's more to it than that. If you're here today, that's step one, and we're going to talk about it. It's one of the steps that you need to have. But I believe there's three things that you can do to cause yourself to have spiritual growth and take responsibility in your life and in your Christian walk. So if you're taking notes, write these down. Number one, if you're taking notes, I think it's important. Number one, I think you have to have personal time with God. Are you all with me? I believe that everybody should have personal time with God. And you might be like, I have no idea what that means, Pastor. What, what does it mean to have personal time with God? So let me, let me break that down for you because I, I know if I was new in church, I would be thinking, I don't know what that means. So think about this. If you were going to have personal time with a person that you really like, with your kids, whoever it might be, what do you do? You spend time with them. So if you're going to have personal time with God, there has to be a way that he's ordained to spend time with him. Are you with me? So in other words, this is part of that. I, I don't deny the fact that, hey, yeah, man, we're, we're here in church. We get to have worship like we did today, which was awesome, right? So, so I, I think all of that is important. But I think when you're out of this place, there's got to be something that you're doing to spend personal time with God. So how, how do I do that? So I, I want to just put it this way. I think there's some choices we all have to make. All of us in this place have to make some choices on a daily basis when it comes to personal time with God. And so if you're taking notes, just jot these down just real quick. I'll, I'll take a minute and explain each one of them. You have to choose to pray. Like I, I choose to pray. And, and you might be here and say, well, what does that look like? I choose to pray. Well, that means no matter where you are, if you're in your car, you're at your house, wherever you're at, you can pray anywhere, anytime you want. This is not complicated. I think people have tried to complicate it like praying is so hard. No, praying is not hard. Praying is you communicating with God and God communicating with you. So if I choose to pray, I can be doing that in my car. No one's there. I could be alone and I can just choose to pray, right? The next one would be I choose to worship God. And I know, I, I, listen, because I, I think sometimes we get confused. I did not say I choose to have a worship experience at home like we just did here. That's not what I'm talking about. 
Worship is you bowing your life to God. Worship looks different than just a worship experience like we just had here with a worship team. I think that's great, and I think you can do that. There are times in my car I'll pop on a worship song, and I'll just sing and worship God. Great. But there are other times, no music at all. I I love this about Jesus. I don't know if you know this or not. Every miracle he did, every healing he did, everything he did, he never had an organ. He never had a keyboard. He never had the bass run that someone needs to have in order for, you know, to, you know, you know like, I'm going to get going here, man. The, the bass is doing the right thing right now. Never had drums. Nothing wrong with any of it. Now, I know there's whole churches that believe this is demonized right here, and it's not. God redeems everything, and this is redeemed when it comes into the church, right? But here's what I want you to know. I can worship God by simply doing this, and I think you should know this. Worshiping God can look like this. Don't do it in your car. Close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes in your car, right? Because that could lead to an accident. But you can worship God at any time by just, Father, I just worship you. Jesus, I worship you. You say, well, I run out of stuff. Well, what else do you need to say? I love you. I worship you. That, that, is, that is us bowing to him, and that is us worshiping him. And then lastly, I choose to read my Bible. Can I, can I tell you that this book that you brought to church or you brought a device that you're reading off of, this is like the thing. There is no other thing. Like you should be reading this Bible. And I've had folks over the years come to me and say, Pastor, I can't understand anything in that book. Well, I want to say something to you and don't, don't get offended. Listen, this is written on a fourth grade level. I've had people come and tell me that are 50 years old. I don't understand anything in this book. Listen, this book, if you're still reading out of a King James Bible, I, I, I study out of it all the time, so I'm not against it. For those that are like, oh my gosh. But here's what I want you to know. If you can't understand the these and the vowels, can you just get a new living Bible? My, my friend, Rick Renner, who um, I'll talk to him every so often. He, he's going to be here coming up in February on one of our first Wednesdays. But Pastor Rick is a Greek scholar, right? So, so he reads the Bible in Greek. Like that's amazing right there just in and of itself. I just, I'm just trying to get English down. So he, he's, he's, you know, he's reading the Bible in Greek, right? And you're like, man, that's so impressive. Well, Rick was here a while back and I was in the uh, green room with him talking. And I said, Rick, which Bible would you recommend for people to read? Like, like if you said, okay, if they want to have a Bible that's easy to read, but it's still very accurate to the original translation, he said, New Living Translation is the one that I would recommend. So if you're here and you're like, man, I just, I don't understand like all this stuff in there about these and thou's, get yourself a Bible that it got rid of the these and thou's. And for you that are here and you're like, that's bad. It got rid of these and thou's. Um, for those that don't know, I just want to make sure you know this Bible, King James asked them to interpret it at his, in his day, right? So the way they talked then was these and thou's. I don't talk that way. Like, you know, old, old school real quick for a moment. People prophesy sometimes, you know, and it's like, they'll do it in these and thou's. It's like, all of a sudden, the Lord became King James. Right? No, no. He's just as, pra- as practical as you and I talk today. God talks today. Right? So, so just real quick, if we're going to have this personal time with God, here's two resources that if you want to write them down. For those that are new to this, if you're not new, I totally get it. You might be like, okay, pastor, this is, this is you know, real simple. It is real simple. But here's two resources for you. The Bible Project app. You can go there and read scripture. I also personally use Bible Gateway because it has all the different translations. So does this. But And then the Bible app. Bible app has all kinds of different translations. If you've been in church for any length of time here, you probably heard of the Bible app. Many people use their Bible reading programs on there. So whatever you, whatever you want to do. But here's the thing. Do something. So before we go on and move to this next thing, I'm telling you, all of us need to be doing something instead of nothing. Guys, listen, if your Bible, if you have a Bible you brought today, if it just gets thrown in the back seat and you never, never touch it again to the next week when you pick it up for uh, church on that weekend, that's not what God wants for you. He wants you to have a time where you literally open your Bible and you read your Bible. Amen. So, so hopefully that helps you with just painting a little bit of a picture. How can I have a personal uh, time with God and a, that personal relationship with God. Second thing, and this one I know you'll love. Second one is, I believe every person should have accountability and they should do that through intentional relationships. 
Thank you. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Here's what I know. I know that I have blind spots in my life. And the only person that's going to tell me about those blind spots is either my wife or someone that I'm in intentional relationship with that can tell me you have some blind spots. You're not seeing certain things. Now, if you're here and you're like, I don't have anyone. I don't have a, a blind spot in my life. And I don't want anyone ever telling me I do. Can I tell you that pride is one of the worst things that all of us have? And if we don't get rid of pride, all of us, if we don't get rid of pride. Pride will cause us to never grow in our relationship with God because we're unwilling. Here, here's what I found out. Sometimes accountability looks like this. It looks like pruning. And sometimes pruning looks like this. God uses someone because everything God does on earth is through people. So he uses someone and we don't like the package he decided to use to go ahead and help prune our lives. So a lot of times, you know, right, we have friends and they'll say something to us. And we're like, I don't know how much longer I can be friends with them. Right? They, they told us something in our life that maybe we feel like, you know, we need some pruning. And it's like, I, I can't handle people telling me that kind of stuff. So John 15, we're not going to read there now, but John 15, starting in verse 1 down to about verse 6, Jesus says that there is going to be a pruning process that all of us have to go through. And guys, here, here, here's, what, here's what pruning looks like. Pruning a lot of times, not all the time, but pruning a lot of times is someone is helping you navigate that you have a blind spot in your life or you have something going on that you might need some help with. It's okay. If someone tells me that, then I just need to go to God and say, God, I, I obviously have something I don't see, but someone else is seeing it and I need help. It's okay. So if you have, if you have someone in your life like this, I think it's great. But can I tell you this? I think if you're part of Faith Family Church, you know this, that I think that you should be in a group and you should be around some other people that are going to be able to speak into your life through and by that group. Now, if you're here and you're like, man, I don't, I don't want anything to do with the group. I don't want anything to do. You're talking about me having to be around people? That, that is just not going to happen. And I want to tell you, it has to happen. I, I, I believe that God made us for relationship. And I believe that we all should be in a group. And I believe that there is something, and I'm going to talk to you about this because, you know, you're sitting in rows today. So you've heard me say this, especially when I teach on us being in groups, that rows are great, but we need to have circles. Well, both of them are important. So I have to have my own personal time with God. I also need to have where I have relationship with people, people that can speak into my life, right? I need that. You need that. That's where groups come in. But I want you to know this in Proverbs chapter 27, it says this, verse six, faithful are the wounds of a friend who corrects out of love and concern. Here's what I know. My wife doesn't ever say something to me that might be a blind spot or might be a correction kind of deal that I need to have in my life that isn't coming out of love and concern. Can I tell you my wife loved me before I ever stood in a stage like this? Can I tell you that all her friends said, do not marry him. He is an idiot. <laughs> all of her friends, everyone, everyone that was in a high school friend of hers told her, do not marry that guy. Now you all come to church. You're like, Pastor Mike, he's just something. He's dreamy. It's like, can I, can I just tell you, my wife loved me when I was not good. So now all these years later, if we're having a conversation and she says, man, there's an area that I, I, you know, let's just talk about this. She doesn't do it often, but there are times, believe it or not, there are times that I need someone to talk to like that. I know it's crazy. Can I tell you that I have to have this mentality and you have to have the same. She's doing this because she loves me and she would only do it out of concern. When you look at people and you think they're only doing it because they want to get one up on you or they don't like you, you'll never grow. We got to have people in our lives that can speak into our lives and say something to us that no one else will say. Um, it goes on and says this, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they serve his hidden agenda. 
Can, can I tell you, there are some people that they're not after your best interests. You don't have to have relationships with those kind of people. But when it comes to a wife, I have certain friends. Uh, Gerald Brooks is one of them. Pastor Gerald, who preached here on a first Wednesday a while back. Tony Cook, who's another guy that we've had preach here multiple times. That I, I can open my life up to them and do so that they can speak stuff into my life and help me. Sometimes you don't like what they say. I've had Gerald Brooks tell me some stuff where I'm just like, I'm going to hang this phone up right now. But I don't. Here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that if pruning was easy and simple, it wouldn't be called pruning. And I want you to know this. Obviously, there's an opportunity to get offended when it comes to pruning. And many people have, and it has stopped their growth because they got offended. I just want to help you. Listen, guys, I have the same, uh, if you would, same kind of uh, propensity that you have to say, I don't want anyone telling me anything that they think I need help in. I'm good. Everybody's like that, but we all need it. We need someone to be able to speak into our lives and say, there's a blind spot. When I started driving, I remember my driver ed teacher back in high school saying, you got to watch out for blind spots. Remember that? Remember they would tell you, there's always a blind spot. You got to watch out, all that kind of stuff. Well, the same thing is true about life. When you're driving down the road of life, there's always blind spots in your life, and we need someone to help us. Can you say amen? All right. So, so I have to have this personal time with God. All of us have to have it. You have to have personal time with God. I'm thankful that you're in church this weekend, but this isn't really what I'm talking about when I say personal time. That's different. And then all of us need this accountability. We need, we need to have intentional relationships. Can I tell you, if you're sitting in church and you've been here for years and you're still not in a group or you don't lead a group, it's time to step up. A pastor friend of mine, I was just in a, a um, uh, uh, little round table deal that he did with about 30, 30 pastors. And I say friend, he's, really, he's not like a close friend, but I consider him a friend now. But he, he said this, he said, um, he said, if you're still in a local church and you've been greeting for 30 years and that's all you do, church should mean movement. Still greet, but get in a group. After you've been in a group, start leading a group. Do not stay stuck at one place your whole life. Thank you. All right. Good night. We're... So here's number three. And this, to me, this is like what I do. I think this is a vital one. I think the third part of this, so there, number one is I have to have that personal time with God. Number two is I have to have accountability, which I believe is getting in a group and having those relationships. Number three is us gathering together, assembling together, coming to church, however you want to word it. But I think gathering together is vital. Like, I don't think you can discount it right? I don't think you can just say, well, we don't need to come on a weekend because we're in a group. I don't think you can do that. You need both. So we need circles, but we also need rows. So I want to just talk to you about this just for a minute. If you've been part of our church and, and, and you go back years ago with us, you'll remember some of this that I've said over the years. But I, I know there's a lot of new folks and this will help you to understand what I'm talking about. So uh, Proverbs, or excuse me, Psalm 92, 12 and 13 says this, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of Jehovah. They shall flourish in the courts of our God. Can I tell you there's a difference from being planted in a church and being potted? Right? There's a, there's a difference. How many, here, how many here have ever bought some potted plants before? And if you don't take care of them, eventually they just start withering. Are you all with me? How many here have ever bought, uh, like if you go to Giant Eagle, one of these stores, right? How many here have ever bought basil that's potted? You know they just broke that basil off and stuck it in a pot. It ain't growing anymore. I water it. I do everything. And then sooner or later, it's just, it's withering up. Now, there are certain ones you can buy in a certain pot that actually they will still keep on growing. But I'm talking about those little ones that are like a little green thing. It ain't growing. You water it, it dies. It doesn't live, Right? Well, that's sort of what your life is like when you don't get planted in a local church. The life that you need is found being planted, not potted. 
Now, listen, it can sound so self-serving for me as a pastor, right? You're like, he just wants people to come to church. I already have people that come to church. I'm not saying this because I want you to come to church. I'm saying this for your spiritual health, not for my benefit, not because pastors is trying to get more people to come to church. No, what I want is I want you to start to grow in your relationship with God. And I believe there's three things you have to do to do that. And this is the third one. You need to be planted in a place you call home. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says, and let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together as believers worship and instruction as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. To me, what these two places in scripture say is we need each other. And I believe this. I believe that God designed church because alone is not an option. God does not want you to be alone. He wants you to be part of a body, of a church. He wants you to gather together with them for a reason. So, so, so I'm going I'm to just take one minute here. Just, I'm going to give you something. I, I probably haven't taught on this for years. So I want to give you something just that our church, when we first started, heard this probably multiple times. In fact, I can see the series right now that I did in the, in the cover. It was back when it was a round circle and said Canton Christian Fellowship. It had our logo in the middle, and it was a series called The Fivefold Ministry. Now, some of you don't even know what that means. You're like, well, what do you mean fivefold ministry? So there's a scripture that I want to just read you and show you what I mean by this. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, so Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service. Now, the word equip in the Greek language means to take a broken bone and reset it. And if you wonder why that's there, the reason why you need a local church, the reason why you need a pastor, Jesus said people are scattered. They're like sheep without a shepherd. The word is pastor, not sheep without an apostle, not sheep without an evangelist, sheep without a shepherd, a pastor. So guys, there are people that are in this business of pastoring, if you would, because it's a vocation. They looked down a number of things they could do, and they said, you know, I wouldn't mind helping some people. I think I'll pastor. And then there are people that have a gift. This part of what God said are five-fold ministry gifts. Different. Now, it says pastor-teacher, those two last things. And in the Greek, it literally says pastor-teacher. So you have, every time you walk into church, you have two of the gifts that God placed there touching you every time. The reason why I can't touch you with the other ones, I'm not, I'm not the other ones. That's why I have guests in. Because they're going to come in and they're going to be able to do something that I don't do because they have a different gift than I have. So we have guests in that, you know, like, for instance, um, Robert Madu. He's a teacher. There's no doubt about it. He can teach. But he's also like an evangelist. He, he, he really is. He, he's a, he's a God-given gift to the body of Christ. So here's what, what I want you to know. I've had people come to me over the years, and if, you, if you've ever said this, don't be offended. Don't, don't be hurt by me saying this. I don't mean it to, to hurt anyone today. But I've had people come to me, and they said this over the years. They said, Pastor, we're going to just start a home church in our home. My husband's going to be the pastor. Well, hey, like, you remember Cracker Jacks, right? And you could get little prizes inside. Like, what, did you get something out of that box that says you could be a pastor? You can't do that. Now, you can do it. Listen, I, I thought about this today. Um, in my house, there's so many people in it, right? I got grandkids in my house. Our, our, our son and, uh, son-in-law and daughter live there. My wife's there. So in the morning, sometimes when it comes to uh, getting ready for church, I want to have a place where I can just go and pray, right? Used to be my basement, but they're in the basement. And so it's like, where do I go? So I was in the garage today. And in the garage, while I was praying out there, I have my car in the garage. I have my truck. I have a truck. My truck was in the garage. I'm not a truck because I was in the garage. Are y'all out there? I can pull my truck in and out of my garage. I can be in my garage, but I'm not a truck because I'm in my garage. I'm not a car because I'm in my garage. You're not a pastor unless God called you. I mean, it's just the bottom line. And the reason why you need to be in a local church that has a pastor that's called, and I'm not saying anything against any other pastor. Please don't think that. Well, what I'm saying is 
I think I'll start a house church. I'll be the pastor and everyone tithes to me in my family. That's awesome. Really convenient, right? Guys, listen, there's a difference between a called person and the reason why you need this right here, the rose, and the reason why you need to come to church is because there's something that God puts in and on a pastor, teacher, that when he's communicating the word of God to you, there are things happening that you don't know about. God's getting things off of you that you don't know about. Uh, when my wife just came up here and exhorted people and was saying some of the things she did and prayed, there were things getting off of people that you, you don't, you're, you're not, it's not like you can see that, but there's a gift on the inside, right? So here's why I'm saying all of that, because I know it can sound really like self-serving saying this, but I'm not really trying to do that. But there's a difference between a call and a vocation. See, over the years, many people have come to our church, and I don't know if you know this or not, but 7,000 churches supposedly a year close in America. Someone said more than that, but 7,000. Over 1,200 pastors quit a month in America from the ministry. So here's the deal. If God calls you and God has put you somewhere, you can't ever just get rid of the calling. But I would, I would say this. How many churches are started that God didn't? I know from since the time we started till now, so many churches in this area started and stopped. Pastors have come and gone. That doesn't, I'm, not, I'm not saying it to cut anyone down. What I'm saying is this. There's true callings. And when you have a true calling, you can't get rid of it. Listen, I'm not, I'm not quitting this to go become a car salesman. Not, car salesmen are fine. If you're here and you're like, I'm a car salesman, thanks a lot. No, 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 I, I don't mean that bad. I'm just saying, I'm not going to go work at McDonald's. I'm not going to go work on a line somewhere at a, at, a, at a place. I'm called. And when you're called, you come to a church and sit under that calling. The same anointing that's on that gift that God put into that person and the anointing of what God has put on that man or woman, whoever it might be, that anointing affects you every time you walk into church. Are you all with me? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Now, I'm in no way am I here to hurt anyone that, or anyone that might be watching. What I'm here to tell you is my heart is your best interest and that you would grow. And here's all I want to tell you in closing this up today. The reason why you need to be in a church like this is to hear someone get up and say this. You need to have a personal relationship with God. Here's how you do it. You need to have accountability. You need to get in a group. Now, I believe this with all my heart. Don't take it wrong. I believe if Jesus walked in today and Jesus came up here and said, this is my friend, Mike. He's doing such a great job. He's awesome. He said to get in a group. When are you going to do it? That there are some of you be like, yeah, never. Jesus is asking. Nope. See, I, I, according to scripture, I am his representative to you. So when I say, hey, I think it'd be good for you to get in a group, you should look at it as, you know what, pastor's not an idiot. I've been doing this for 30 years here and five years before that, 35 plus years doing what he's doing. He must think there's something important about being in a group, leading a group. I think I'll get in one. Now, we're not, we don't have group weekend this weekend. We should, <laughs> um, but we, we don't. Like this isn't, we're not promoting groups right now, but I'm telling you, we are promoting groups. All of us need to be in one. My friend, Chris Hodges, who pastors in Birmingham, Alabama, he has more people on the weekend or during the week in groups than they have in the weekend at church. Now, if you're here and you're like, well, it must be a sad church. Yeah, they have 40 some thousand on the weekend. So it's a big church, but they have 50,000 people in groups. Why? Because people are inviting people in their neighborhood before they ever even come to church to come to a group. And then eventually they do come to church. I just want you to know that all of us need to be in groups. Amen? So let's close this up and and, and, and finish this out because I think think you get what I'm saying. I think when all of those that are watching us right now online, I think it's a great avenue, right? But you know who really misses out when you think about online is the kids that literally be in a class that is specifically for them, right? Right? You can't can't get that. You can't get a teacher that cares about them online because why? They see me. They don't see their class. They see me. They don't see other kids that they're around. So I want you to consider that. Those that are watching online need to consider it. 
your kids are the ones that miss out. They need community as much as anybody else. So that, that would be something that I would encourage you about. So in closing, here's what I want you to do. One, one simple thing that I want you to do, you can take a picture of this or write it down. Be intentional with your relationship with God. Start, start, start having that personal time. Begin reading your Bible, practicing your Bible, and gather as frequently as you can. I'll say it one more time just because I know people are writing it down. Be intentional with your relationship with God. Begin reading your Bible and practicing it and gather as frequently as you can. How many know it's not how much Bible you know, it's how much you live, right? I know a man who got up out of a deathbed by one scripture and he had three incurable diseases. Three incurable diseases. You will never live past the age of 16. He found Mark chapter 11, read verse 24 and verse 23 and 24. And within a month, got up out of that situation and lived till he was 86 years old. That's amazing to me that you can find one scripture that will get you out. So it's not, not how many you know, it's what you live. So my prayer for you this weekend is that I help to encourage you, not, not discourage you, but encouraged you to say, you know what? I'm going to do something about my walk with God. I'm going to grow in my relationship with God. I am going to be intentional about growing. And I'm going to take these steps and I'm going to do something about it. Let's pray. If you'll stick with us just for a moment, we'll dismiss you here in a minute. Father, thank you for every person watching us, wherever they're watching us from. And thank you for every person in this room. I pray for them, Father, that each becomes more intentional about their relationship with God. Father, I know you have a love for every person in this place, a love that is far greater than even my love that I have for them because no one can love like you. So I thank you because of your love that each person here today walks out knowing God cares about them, this church cares about them, this pastor cares about them, but more than anything, they need to take personal responsibility to grow in their relationship with God. I thank you for that. Thank you for touching each person's heart. In Jesus' name, as eyes are... We have a passion at Faith Family Church to discover all that God has for us. We welcome and honor our guests so you can experience a church that is full of life and encounter a God that's real and loves you. Our worship experiences are designed for every age, helping you to live out a personal relationship with Jesus and develop an authentic faith in Him. We want to redefine church as you might know it, and we're reaching people around the world through our live stream. Because Faith Family Church is for families, for singles, for couples, for the elderly, for young people, for the hurting, the lost, the hopeless. Faith Family Church is for people.